Okay, hi, my name is Mashka Sharkar. I teach at UCSB's Film and Media Studies Department. And uh, it's just an incredible pleasure for me to welcome Paramita Vora. We have just seen her film, uh, Partners in Crime, which I sort of always thought has a subtitle, uh, A Love Story, but I guess it doesn't. Uh, 1911. 2011. Sorry, 2011. 1911 would be a little difficult, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Paro, uh, how did you come to make this film? I'm thinking specifically in terms of your earlier films, which are often about women. And not only, but morality TV, I can <laughs> remember, but you know, like uh, Where is Sandra, which is about Catholic girls in the Bandra area of uh, Mumbai, or uh, Unlimited Girls which much of it takes place in the chat room. Mm. Um, so this is very different. Mm -hmm. It's in fact also more expository in a different kind of way that you normally don't do. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm wondering. I mean, uh, it's true that uh, my other films have had sort of more directly feminist topics, so to speak. Um, but if you think about it, like whether it's Unlimited Girls and the chat room or whether it's depictions of Catholic women in movies in West Sandra or uh, kind of the impact of television culture on morality in um, morality TV and the loving jihad. There's also an interest in technology mm. and ways of looking and how that shapes the way we think about the world, right? And so I think uh, in some ways there is a kind of natural trajectory that leads to partners in crime, but it's not very obvious on the surface, which is to say what is, how do we decide something is valuable and meaningful or not. But in more, uh, for me too, when I was asked to make the film, the film was commissioned by an organization, Magic Lantern Foundation, and they asked me a couple of times to make the film, and both times I said, no, I don't want to make it, it's a very boring topic. I don't want to make film in copyright. And I mean, there were many reasons, one of them being that in those years, uh, the early years of the internet in some ways being common, uh, the proliferation of digital technology. There were a lot of conversations about copyright and copyleft and that's normally how one heard about these issues. Right? It's the frame of law and technology and it used to feel very dry and distant from my life. But around the time that I made the film, I had begun to write some scripts for um, Bollywood directors or attempt to write some scripts and I had to sign many contracts so all the contracts which you saw in the Script Writers Association section which have highlighted clauses where you have to give your kidney, your children's kidney and their children's kidney to the producer you sign with, those were all my contracts. So I was having to sign these horrible contracts which <laughs> bewildered me. And I also went to Punjab, a state in the north where popular music is very big uh, to research a film. And I discovered there the fact that there were all these musicians and lyricists and composers and they had written all these great hit songs which had been recorded by the company T-Series that is spoken about in the film. And they were not allowed to perform those songs once they had been sold to the company. Mm -hmm. And at that moment, I think for me, the penny dropped a bit better that this was actually completely related to my life and the work that I do as an independent director because usually copyright is also spoken about for very big organizations mm -hmm. like big companies right like Hollywood people and Bollywood people are really interested in copyright and Sony wants to talk about music copyright but what actually happens to the independent way of making films and people like us like we get caught between copyleft and copyright. Mm -hmm. Neither of those two actually accommodate people like me. So I became interested therefore in exploring this theme and I've really learned a lot about what I think as well as what is going on in the world by making it. I was also thinking about the context because this is about 20 years into uh, the so-called economic liberalization of India when India opens up under IMF pressure, of mm -hmm. course, in mm -hmm. 1991. And then this sort of uh, massive burgeoning of a middle class, 200, 300 million people mm. and the kind of consumerism that starts with it. But this is also the moment when, for instance, in Bombay cinema, which becomes Bollywood exactly at this point, there's an orchestrated effort to turn it into an industry mm. that is sort of 
keeping accounts properly, using bound copies of the script even before going on. These are not things that happened before. So yes. this, is, this is a kind of standardization around a certain logic of the market, a certain trajectory of corporatization. Yeah. I mean, I think what's interesting is that there is a parallel to that moment when economic liberalization happens and new markets, new industries, new practices are emerging, but also new languages are emerging. Uh, digital technology, which comes very soon on the heels of that moment. 1991 is when liberalization happens in India. But there's also a parallel with, with early years of colonialism, if you think about it. Mm -hmm. If you think about the fact that colonial law tries to bring into conformity so many traditional practices, yeah. and while doing that, it outlaws most things which are related to pleasure and eroticism, especially in the performing arts, right? And it says that all of those things are vulgar, illicit, and do not belong in respectable society. And you can see a kind of interesting parallel thing occurring. So I I would say that in 91, uh, when liberalization happened, there was a growth of television channels and a spurt in media. And definitely people like me uh, benefited because we belong to that strange in-between category where we knew Western culture, we could speak English, uh, we could understand this kind of slightly global way of being. But we, I mean, I loved Hindi film songs and that was considered to be a bit shameful, infradic, <laughs> to like Hindi film songs when I was growing up, right? But suddenly it became a cool thing mm -hmm. because there was a need to create a new language to expand the market for these new media companies and these, well, so many new products that were being created to create a language of advertising and television which would reach both metropolitan and small town audiences. And it needed to remix, actually, all mm -hmm. these cultures. So uh, many of us inhabited this world and I would say that in its first moment, it's very libidinal, right? Like mm. you're suddenly called upon to use many energies and many desires. And it's also the marketplace is always being spoken about in terms of desire. Like one of the most popular jingles was for Pepsi and it was Yedil Mange More, the heart wants more. Mm -hmm. And you were encouraged to want more all the time rather than be self-sacrificing for the new nation, which is actually what many of us grew up with. So the idea that you are supposed to experience a lot of desire and the market is going to open up many choices is the kind of liberal energy which pushes a lot of people in. And it definitely creates new spaces, new players uh, in the field. But what begins to happen, I would say, around the late 90s, early 2000s, definitely that Bollywood especially, I mean, like popular cinema, starts to go through this kind of sanitization phase. I, I don't even like to think of it as standardization because it's always being spoken about because I also wrote a television, like a BBC business <laughs> series about the business of Bollywood. So when I was reading all the research, I thought it's so interesting that every earlier practice is now seen as a bad practice. Mm -hmm. Right, The whole market and the whole culture of Bollywood cinema, which has prospered until now, is now considered to be primitive. Mm -hmm. uh, so the big thing is that we are now in the era of the bound script. So it's like a Bible, what Netflix calls the Bible actually. So there's a kind of religiosity almost with which yeah. the bad money that funded Bollywood, the people who were not respectable, because it was not respectable to be in movies before that. Suddenly all of these things are made um, unfashionable, unpalatable, and a new respectability which is corporate owned arises, right? So the guy that you see from the Producers Asso uh, Movie Motion Pictures Association, etc., these are all people who are part of multinational corporations that are entering mm. this gigantic new market which has earlier value. With an MBA. Companies. With an MBA, of course, yeah. So yeah, this I think it's a moment in which there's a possibility of much newness that is arising mm -hmm. uh, and digital technology is actually questioning that market. I was actually smiling to myself by, while watching the film because I thought we were hopeful. We thought actually that piracy and the internet would challenge capitalism, but I think none of us believe that anymore. <laughs> And it goes back to Brecht and the possibilities for radio yeah, yeah. in the 20s, yeah, yeah 1920s. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I, I was fascinated. I, I am still fascinated. You know, I was recently thinking about the idea of the bazaar mm -hmm. and how the bazaar's transformation into the market mm -hmm. and always the understanding was, that was pushed at least, was that to modernize, the bazaar must be left behind overcome, move beyond as a vestigial thing, mm. it might remain a little bit. Mm. But so there's a kind of capture that happens, the reordering of aspirations, yes, but also the reordering of market logics, but market practices. Yes. Right? Yes. So for instance, uh, you know, the 19th century uh, bazaars, like, you know, like the financial markets, 
the Marwaris were thought of as making bets that were not quite licit. Mm. And yet, when you do this on the stock market, it suddenly suddenly becomes quite okay, quite yeah. kosher. And I find this kind of moment of capture in various points in this film where someone is saying, but we already did that. They just came and recorded it, mm -hmm. captured it in a way, mm -hmm. and then suddenly we can't do this anymore. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, the folk music section especially is interesting in that respect because it's capturing both the moments, the moment of colonization mm -hmm. and the, mo the contemporary moment, right, which, which the film is talking about. But the idea that like folk music is relegated to some kind of museumized thing. Mm -hmm. It is captured and recorded as belonging to primitive peoples that are being colonized, right? It's ethnic. And so it's no longer allowed to exist in a marketplace of desires, whether it's, I mean, a lot of folk music is tied to traditional practices. So people come to sing at weddings, people come to sing at deaths. There are so many different kinds of performance arts that are related to life, uh, life cycle. Uh, suddenly you say that, oh, this is just something from ancient times, it doesn't really belong to now, so it's not part of the marketplace. It belongs to everybody, so it belongs to nobody, except to the recording company that has made the record of that music. So people can no longer, they become invalidated, they get written out of the market space. And only people who work by the logic of the company then can exist in the market. Because when the market is brought into conformity, it's a little bit like... Monogamy, right? Mm -hmm. Like every practice outside matrimony, monogamous matrimony is now illicit. And similarly, everything that is not part of the corporate market and doesn't fall into those rules is black market or at most gray market. But when you look at the bazaar, and there are many sequences of the bazaar uh, in the film, there's bargaining, mm -hmm. there's barter. There are many ways in which desires can be met, just as with relationships. So actually to connect to your earlier questions about my earlier films, which are about feminist kinds of themes. I think making a film about piracy and uh, copyright and actually capitalism as a feminist makes a difference because right. I'm actually entering it from that question of relationality, mm -hmm. which is what the marketplace is, that there are people uh, who, uh, you know, there are uh, relationships of trust in markets where nothing is written down where I just say, I owe you this money and I keep my word. So in a way, Bob Dylan's line that to live outside the law, you must be honest, mm -hmm. is a question of ethics. It's not a question yes. of law. So what is it, market, the bazaar works by ethics, that you want this and I will give you this and I will not cheat you. Mm -hmm. uh, I will allow you to decide along with me what is the correct price of something. If you want to bargain me down a bit, we'll come to a meeting point. This is a completely different relationship between the seller and the buyer mm -hmm. in the bazaar as opposed to what the market says that is just what I tell you. I mean, the market, the corporate market is like Darth Vader, right? Like we don't really know what is behind. <laughs> so yeah, I think that when you think about why piracy arises, as people say in the film, it is a pushback to that fact that there can be actually no open relation between the, or the audience or the consumer and the seller or the artist. Why is it, do you think, <clears throat> So uh, I'm thinking now of this Chinese film from the early 2000s called Pirated Copy, mm -hmm. in which there's this uh, uh, woman professor, probably in the Beijing Film Academy, she wants to show her students famous films from all over the world, the world history type of thing that mm -hmm. we see here for a sec. And she can't find it, she can't source. Ultimately, it's a pirate, mm -hmm. media pirate on the street mm -hmm. who starts to source this for her and she's really happy, but the pirate is very hot. So mm -hmm. she has this crazy, like, <laughs> kind of like carnal relationship with her, mm -hmm. with the clear sense that there'll be nothing more, you know, tangibly, you know, more stable at the, later on. Or, you know, why does Johnny Depp, pretty boy, have to pay, play, you know, the ugly guy? What is it about pirates that it's always eroticized, you think? Yeah, well, I think pirates, it's interesting because uh, it's uh, adventurous, right, to be a pirate. It's daring, it's daring to plunge into the world of desire. Um, it is uh, that if you think about actual pirates in the old days, then essentially somebody is saying, I have the right to transport things from one place to the other and sell it to you at my price. And somebody is like, I want it too. So there is something very gray about that. Like there's a certain mixture of consensuality and uh, Robin Hoodness, mm -hmm. and uh, so it's a Robin Hood of desires in a way, the pirate, right? Like, I wish to have something and I can't have it, and you're going to give it to me. Uh, so I think the, that swashbuckling quality of love, in a way, is very much there in the pirate. Uh, but I think the pirate also does question what passes for propriety, right? There is a kind of uh, 
ongoing thread in the film with Ravan, who, uh, who is part of the Ramayana famous epic, and he is seen as being evil. He has taken away, he has abducted uh, a woman in the, in the story. And uh, there are many versions of these narratives. Uh, and so in some, there is also the song that, that you know, Ravan is considered to be, uh, Ram is considered to be a great guy, but he had, hadn't his brother cut off Ravan's sister's nose and shouldn't he have told him not to do that? Mm -hmm. So the fact that propriety is always supposed to be standing on the side of right mm -hmm. and the pirate is always on the side of wrong, that is kind of questioned in so many subaltern versions of epics, for instance, Correct. right? So whoever is in power or whoever stands by law or the correct way, often leaves out many, many, many different people who can't have because their desires are not acknowledged or their abilities are not acknowledged. So when Osama, who is the pirate at the beginning of the film, and it's really interesting that his name is Osama, because you know later on there's a whole connection between Al-Qaeda and piracy and terrorism. But actually he says this very simple thing that uh, the pirated DVDs are sold for different prices in different markets. Mm -hmm. That in posh areas they're sold for more and not so posh areas they're sold for less. So it's also a market that is about people's abilities, not only their desires and not an exploitation of desires, yeah. but a meeting of desires. So I think the pirate represents all these mixed up things. It's a kind of, yeah, a figure who speaks to the powers that be. Since the MPA guy said that if you take a close look at the Treverton report on behalf of the RAND Corporation that uh, tries to connect piracy to uh, a terrorist cells. Um, I did a while back and uh, it continuously says things like, we know that the evidence is fragmentary. However, we have no doubt. I mean, what is the basis of that? It's not clear that we have no doubt that this is true. Mm. Or they say things like, yes, it is true that the MPAA has funded our studies, but we assure you that every step we took precautions so that we no bias is crept in. But we don't know what those steps were ever, right? Yeah. So it's the most unbelievable doublespeak that goes on throughout. This report was considered so bad that the Social Science Research Council had to come out with a study that counters this move. Because there's a long history of demonization. Mm -hmm. A long history of demonization where pirates, pederasts, parasites, all these people th things are lumped together. Yeah. And because they're like really low life forms, then you can use any means to eradicate them. Um, terrorists are also that type because as we know, we think of terrorism, but of course there are other people's jihadis or freedom fighters. Mm -hmm. So that's there too, right? I mean, it's also funny that, you know, in this country, we had the war against drugs, then we had the war against piracy, and then we had the war against terror. So actually, the gentleman who has formed an NGO against piracy, he says that when I ask him that it's the, you know, CSR is supposed to be for social good, and he's like, well, then why don't you sell drugs? Why don't you sell guns? So this idea that all of these criminalities are associated and they are all immoral, and that you will be protected from the same morality, right? So the way that the government becomes somebody who supports what the corporate is doing. So that relationship of colonialism and capitalism kind of gets sustained in this relationship of governments and global capital and how governments also are in fact invalidating so many work practices as well as so many identities. Uh, and these two things are intertwined, right? The terrorist and the person on the street who is selling a pirated DVD being equated is a kind of mutual service which is not of the citizen in mm -hmm. any way. Munni Badnam Hui. Yes. <laughs> it's just this incredible song, Munni Badnam Hui, O Darling Tere Liye. So the, this young lass has, become, has gotten a bad reputation because of you, darling. Mm -hmm. uh, that it became a huge hit some years back, but this, has, uh, this film really demonstrates what, how impossible it is to like kind of find the origin, to stick it. And so if you just quickly want to talk about that part. But I also think it's great that it's that particular song because that song also is about, it's not only that Munni has lost her reputation, Munni has lost her honor because of you. So I think that persistent kind of language of desire, libido, the illicit kind of runs through whatever you encounter in these worlds, right? Uh, but I think that yes, Munni Badamui shows you that there is a huge cultural commons from which we all draw. You don't really know when a story began and who made it and you can't create laws uh, which are based on this idea of property. That actually when it comes to the arts, there has to be a completely different value system. Mm -hmm. And ha the fact remains that arts become 
valuable because we love them. It is because we love something or somebody or their work that actually it becomes popular and we generate its value through that love. So can law be actually framed, keeping in mind the way that art grows? Uh, art is a cultural conversation. The very nature of culture is in some senses a kind of piracy because we're always taking from each other and making something new with it. Mm -hmm. So at that level, I don't think it is possible to decide that there is an originary point which will now be copyrighted. It's a very, copyright and plagiarism are not the same thing. Mm -hmm. And they're often spoken about it in conflated terms because it's a moral kind of argument, right? Um, and I, so I think that, yeah, Muni Badnamuni demonstrates it very clearly that it has passed from ear to ear and tongue to tongue. And it should remain, it should remain in the cultural commons, so people should be able to use it because every person who renders a version of it yeah. does make a profit. Uh, I want to say a very interesting thing that, um, uh, that Christy Merrill has written this essay where she talks about how translations, etymology is about moving from one place to the other. But in Hindi, the word anuvad, which means translation, actually means to speak in your turn. Mm. And there is a lot in oral practice which recognizes the individuality of the artist mm -hmm. without insisting on like an original thing. Mm -hmm. So the originality lies in the way that you render it. That's what Vijayadan Deta says in the film, right? That it's, that there's a banyan in every seed. Mm -hmm. The seed, or the stories, it's a sea of stories. And we are continuously drawing from those sto that sea of stories to make our stories and then putting something back, putting our story back in that sea, whether we like it or not. So this idea of the commons, which, which copyright also talks about, actually is very much the idea of art itself and how art is a huge cultural conversation that has been crossing borders, crossing hearts, you know, crossing boundaries forever. The museum and the popular, mm. that part was yes. very striking. Mm. It kind of came and went, but mm -hmm. say that a bit more. So, uh, you know, Irfan, the person who says this thing, who collects all those cassettes and uh, plays them on the radio because the place all India Radio, which is the government-owned radio station, should logically have everything in its archive. Mm -hmm. But it's unable to or doesn't want to or doesn't have the interest in it or doesn't have the heart for it. Uh, maybe it's not a big enough audience or whatever. So the museum which seeks to be the authority on what is valuable in a culture, what is worth saving in a sense, uh, often doesn't include the things that we love. Uh, so it is people who save those things through their memories of a song. I mean. There will be many of you, today, in the day of the internet, we think that we can have any song. But I, I know that there are songs you can look for on the internet which you won't find because they haven't been saved and you can keep looking every year and then suddenly one year you will find it because somebody who loved the song decided to upload it. So it's a continuously growing archive in that sense of people's love and people's feeling that this is valuable, it matters to me. So I think that argument for love in the popular that the popular is made up of the things that we sim that simply bring us a lot of pleasure, and that pleasure uh, pleasure embeds itself in the memory. That property of our memory, in a sense, uh, is what the popular holds. All and often it also holds all the things that are declared unimportant and illicit and unnecessary by authorities of all kinds and tastemakers and gatekeepers of different kinds. So I would say that you know it's actually that that one sentence of Irfan's that uh, what what. What the museum keeps, people often don't really want, but what people love the museum doesn't think is valuable. It says a lot about also the arts themselves, that what makes a work of art valuable is not always decided by a museum or a curator or um, a, a company or money or numbers. It is also decided by whether people love it and make it part of themselves or not. We can't really think of piracy in strictly legal terms, can we? Mm -hmm. It has to be thought of as a broader cultural practice. Yeah. I mean, I think of piracy with respect to these media practices that we watched in the film as a kind of definitely a resistance to the oppression of the global market. Mm -hmm. Like a pushing back because you won't allow people to have things that they wish for. Uh, a questioning of the market. The market presents itself as a space of choice. Mm -hmm. right? And the idea that there should be a free market implies that there will be freedom for people and freedom of our desires. But in fact, the market is anything but that. It, it actually takes things further and further out of our reach. Things that were part of our lives cease to become just ordinary parts of our lives via the market. So the market is 
maybe the owners of the market are free, but most, but nothing else is free in the market, right? So I think the, the pirate is a kind of a pushback to that hypocrisy of the market, and it's a correction. I won't, I am not really glamorizing the idea of the, of the pirate or putting the pirate on a pedestal, because I think that this is an evolutionary thing. It can't be a fixed idea. There was certainly a fashion in the 90s to say that, you know, piracy is amazing and it's great and we should pirate everything. So I don't know. Like, I think that if people pirate small producers' works or independent artists' works, how does that artist live? Uh, so we, that's why I think it's about ethics. The market is about ethics. For instance, if I were to, I have freely used copyrighted material in all my films and not paid rights for it because it belongs to huge corporations. But if I were to take something from an independent artist, I would never do it without permission, without trying to pay them. So I think that just as the pirate sells us something at different prices depending on our ability, we as users also have to come up with an ethical way of engaging with the arts. Uh, I think that just like you know, monogamy decides for us what is respectable and what is the way of love. But ethics between people and their relationships and emotions define what is fair and what's, what's a way to honor the, what happens between people. So too can our relationship with the arts as individuals define what is right, proper, legal, and so on. So Lawrence Lessig, the famous hmm. proponent of cultural commons, etc., once wrote in the Free Culture book that, you know, what is there in places like India, Brazil, Russia, is piracy plain and simple, that adds no value, it's just mere poaching. Mm. But we saw here multiple instances where it's not mere poaching, it's performing very different and interesting roles, mm. if you might take us to a few of those. Well, I mean, I think quite clearly what piracy is doing in many instances is it's actually creating the market. Yeah. Like, for example, I think a very interesting thing about technology is that pornography generates most technological advances, right? Mm -hmm. like, like being able to pay with your credit card online is something that pornography made possible. So uh, uh, very often things are created, machines are created for purposes of war and they're immediately repurposed for sex and love, right? The internet is created for reasons of war, but we all know what we use it for maximum. So the thing is that that, that human libido, the desire that propels actually something to happen, which is the world of the erotic, right? It can also be the desire for poetry, the desire for song, the enjoyment of a movie, this kind of weird desire to collect movies and accumulate them on your hard disk and have everything, right, that you love and to be uh, almost soaking in the luxury of that desire. What you didn't ask was, has he seen them? How uh, many yeah, has he, he seen? I don't think he can see all of those films. <laughs> <laughs> he used to go to work sometimes, right? But that's the thing. And, and it, of course, raises that question that you don't value what you have a lot of. And I mean, there are all these co questions to be had about collecting and hoarding. Uh, but I think that, you know, in the sequence where you talk about the story porn film, mm -hmm. that people go to the pirated DVD guy for porn films, then they start buying these world cinema films, which they call story porn films. And now there is, there is a market for world cinema in India, right? And you could also argue that it has influenced some important filmmakers Absolutely. and helped them, find, uh, help them find an audience. Because as the audience starts to watch films from around the world, their vocabulary also changes. So actually it makes many new things possible, which uh, wouldn't be possible if those pirated DVDs weren't there. If I'm not wrong, the pirate that uh, Lawrence was mentioning, Lawrence mm -hmm. Liang, this is someone to, to whom people like Gish Kasharavali go, like really every, well known. So <laughs> actually, the, this, the, there are one or two guys, there were one or two guys that would go with these big bags of DVDs from house to house. Mm. And they would go to all the really celebrated art directors who would buy the films from them and then suggest them to their other friends. So it was a kind of network that would come to your house and sell DVDs the way that uh, people sell Bengali saris. You know, there are the Bengali sari sellers. They come during the festival from house to house and sell us saris. So it, it was kind of like that. Yes, certainly. So it began like, in fact, you know, the story of the Chinese film is so funny because one of my favorite documentaries ever is Chronicle of a Summer. And I had seen it in film festival and I deeply, deeply wanted to have that film. And finally, um, Nicole Wolf got it for me from a pirated DVD seller in Pakistan. <laughs> well, the Indian government might say piracy funds terrorism. <laughs> I don't know if we have a copy in the department. We have to look into this. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So, uh, and of course, that archiving of the, in the absence of a state that does not do much. 
to preserve this insanely rich reporter, like huge, huge archive of like uh, live performances, mm -hmm. where each performance is improvised and therefore is completely singular. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you have a classical music, yeah. I mean, yes. I think that, you know, it also raises questions about the singular market model that we have. Like, okay, that model is so good and fertile on its own that it will equalize everything and make everything possible. We see it's not true. In some ways, what the classical music tradition is asking for is patronage, right? Somebody who loves it, values it, recognizes its worth and wishes to preserve it. In a way, those guys who are active in preserving it, they have the wealth and the means to do it. So that's great. But it's really a question that should everything in the market be for monetary profit? Should everything have such a unitary basis for being valued and deciding if it was successful or not? Or can there be actually other, other ways of valuing something? Uh, we talk fast, both of us, so we've covered a lot of ground. So I've come to my last question, and then we can open it up for Q&A. Um, so, you know, Paro is interesting. She has done a couple of pretty big deal uh, script writing jobs for Bombay Cinema, um, for very big uh, directors. She has done a 64-episode TV show. Um, in which the subjects, the women that sh the show is about, were given cameras and they shoot themselves for a whole year and then she comes in and kind of puts it together in a way. So there are all these things that she has done and there's a website that I want you to take a look at. Uh, she did a brilliant talk last afternoon on it called Agents of Ishq, which is all about love and desire uh, from a feminist and queer per perspective. So the trajectory of your career you know, the way you have negotiated being an indie media maker, that kind of work life in the shadow of capital, in the belly of the beast, as it were. Uh, to what extent is this related to your understanding of intellectual property, mm -hmm. the informal economy, and the media industry? Mm -hmm. I think that uh, that's a difficult question to answer, but certainly I would say that uh, my own work life has been an example of you can't derive your worth only from gatekeepers, which is what the documentary film world actually is based on. It's a marketplace of value that is decided by film festivals, curators, who are in turn very much influenced funders. by funders, of course, but which are largely Western. They come from mm -hmm. this part of the world. So it's a way of thinking about cinema that is actually rooted in this part, in this part, in the social space. Uh, so I think um, my own work life has shown me that if I had relied on that, I would be more depressed than I already am. So, in a sense, but the love of audiences or the fact that people love your work and use your work has got to be a way that you understand its value, which I've really learned to do. At the same time, since you do, you cannot live on love and fresh air, even if it's a practical requirement that you have love and fresh air. I do think that, you know, existing between this copyright market and copyleft market, actually that is a space of the creative commons where you, you partake of many. If you partake of diverse market spaces, you are actually able to do the work that you want to do. You're actually able to uh, have a whole trajectory in which you experiment, explore, engage with audiences, learn from audiences, and also create new things. If you exist not in this you know, very hermetic world of I'm in the copy left or alternative world and I'm in the mainstream world, I don't agree with this with this division of mainstream and alternative or even art and popular. I think they're all one and somewhere in the middle because, you know, there's a very binary discussion, right? Copyright and copyleft are both slightly moral positions um, and in the middle, which is where our heart and our crotch and our gut, all the stuff that life is made of are is actually a pretty good place where you can do many things that people tell you you can't be done. Yeah, that's what my learning is, and I think that's what informed my making of this film as well. Because what did I, I mean, what about that young boy who's a schoolboy, and he's like, he just wants to get those CDs, right? He wanted the CDs, so he started his whole setup of selling CDs and his little distribution system from his bedroom. And like, who, like in a country like India, being a death metal band is a pretty, like, 
you know, I mean, it's a country of Bollywood songs. But nevertheless, death metal has a pretty decent uh, space Niche. of its own today. Yeah, I mean, much more than when Sahil Makija started that first metal event. So I think that you do see so many, you make a, you make a uh, kind of comradeship with others who work like this. And you can survive, even if the world tells you that you can't survive. Students, take note, I asked the last question <laughs> on your behalf. But now is a good chance to ask your own questions. And anybody else, let's open it up for Q&A. Hi. Um, so some of the people that you interviewed in your film who are more in favor of the existing um, copyright laws, basically the copyright apparatus, would did they see your film? Do you know how they received it? Um, I mean, everybody who was in the film got a copy of the film. So I just want to say that M.M. Satish, who started the piracy, anti-piracy NGO, asked me if I would make a film for him. <laughs> <laughs> about his NGO. After so, watching the film? Yeah, well, some time after. But yes, he had seen the film. So I was like, I think maybe I'm not your person. But uh, I mean, yeah. So I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know if uh, the person who represented the Motion Producers Association saw uh, what he thought of the film because he never told me. But I, after the interview had finished, he did say to me that I wasn't prepared for someone who's going to ask us serious questions. Because usually when journalists come in, they just ask us very ordinary questions, which is to say that even the media is not questioning these things, right? So he was not prepared to be questioned on what he's doing. And he recognized that he had kind of dug a hole for himself, but he was pretty sporting about it, I have to say. <laughs> Thank you so much for this. I'm, 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 I'm trying to, sitting through your uh, talk yesterday, uh, and then tonight, uh, I'm trying. You know, I'm, I'm finally realizing why I love you so much. <laughs> you know, and that is why I just love your approach, your stance, your the kind of engagement you have, and and also just thinking about where are those communities? I mean, where you know, bringing together like your interests in feminism, desire, sexuality, and popular culture, and where are these? ethical uh, relations to art, these ethical engagements with art going on. And I realized that, uh, and I just will throw this out to you, that two areas, two constituencies where I see that going on, uh, fan culture, especially like erotic fan culture, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, porn. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's where I see uh, the most sophisticated, complex, and fun discussions, hmm. you know, of our engagement with sexuality, desire, feminism, popular culture, hmm. uh, but, but really uh, in uh, just an astonishingly uh, uh, consideration of the ethics of our engagement. Yeah, I think that certainly uh, in spaces of sexuality, but I would say also emotional spaces, where spaces are emotional. And of course, within pornography, there is a lot of unethical work that happens. There is a lot of non-consensuality. The internet also has allowed a lot of non-consensual sexual videos to be put out there. And, you know, we can talk about ethical porn, but ethical porn is often not as easy to access for people. So while the conversations are going on, I wouldn't I wouldn't make any of these spaces the only locus of those conversations. I think on, that communities of ethics are continuously trying to make themselves known. And often the larger environment doesn't make it very easy. So you, might, you also have really beautiful arts communities that are coming up. I think the world of the arts is that, like the world of eros, which is sex, love, desire, relationships, but also art, and also these other markets that people create in order to be able to share all these desires, in a way those are the spaces where questions of ethics do come up continuously, right? So if there's an artist's collective, for example, or people who are making individual art and putting it out on the internet, there are many questions of ethics that arise. If I'm making work on Agents of Ishq and putting it out there in the public domain and not charging people for it, there is an ethics of whether you will take from what I have given and not attribute it to me and I can't control it, or whether you will always attribute. If I take something from you, how do I attribute you? So I think these considerations always exist in smaller communities. Uh, the question of how can we translate them into larger 
kind of systems is one that I don't think anybody has the answer to. These are all efforts, right? I think uh, in connection with what Bhaskar asked me about how I exist as an artist, I think that's also a kind of metaphor for we cannot exist only in the domain of law. We look to law to sanitize and make everything right. But in truth, we live partially by law, partially by personal ethics, and partially by all co complex relationalities to different things. So I think that the interweave of all of that actually is something we want to bring to the foreground and say that neither one of these spaces is the absolute space. Thanks, Paro. I saw this a long time ago, so it was a pleasure to see it again. And I was wondering, I was actually amazed at the number of media mm. that, that you go through, mm. uh, and the fact that you got invited into some of these spaces, mm. right? So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your, uh, the process of making the film. Mm. Did you choose particular things that you were following and then fell into mm you know, other leads, because you organize it according to chapters, hmm. yeah, which are kind of not really about the different media, but they're points of entry, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. And you give us a form to hold on to, but how did you follow those trails and put it together? Yeah, I mean, I think it's very difficult when you make a film, uh, there's sometimes, I mean, earlier when I made a film on toilets, because nobody was really talking about toilets, it was very hard at one level, because you really had to find things, right? There was no pre-existing kind of research from which you could draw. So that had its own difficulty. But the reverse difficulty can happen in a subject like this, where you could end up making a film with a lot of talking heads, talking about the law, or even piracy, or like a very theoretical kind of thing. So how to find that thing in life, is a kind of question. But I would say that in terms of process, definitely the film followed a kind, I, I mean, we read a lot of the research that people working in Creative Commons and copyleft kind of work had created. So we read through all of that, read these histories that we were not aware of, and that helped to understand the domain. Uh, and initially, I think like the first few days of shooting, I really shot very traditional things. Like I shot all the things that were obvious, like say, the interview with uh, Lawrence and Rahul, or people that I already knew about uh, from this kind of alternative space, so to speak. But then as we began working on the film, and you think more about the themes that are arising, you start to look uh, and uh, look for other spaces in which this is occurring. So for example, the metal bands. That really occurred because I was searching for some kind of musical space which was contemporary, where young people were making something together, kind of analogous to the way documentary filmmakers and independent filmmakers work. And actually, I had a friend who was a very quiet, very sober young man. I used to do some work with him. And the work that I used to, I think like there were these networks where you know somebody knew how to do Photoshop. So they would make the poster of your film, and you would become friends with them, though they were from a very different world than yours. And he would always tell me, I have to go for band practice, I have to go for band practice. And I never really thought about it, but one day I asked him, what, what is the band that you're playing? And he said, I'm in a metal band. And you know, he was a very quiet guy who didn't drink or smoke or wear black t-shirts or anything. So I couldn't believe it. And then that's how I actually entered that space and I asked him how it works. And I began to understand that there are all of these other independent networks which are joining up these these, these different energies, a little bit of sponsorship, a little bit of barter, I'll make your film, I'll make your promo video, you help me to mix my sound. So they're actually making it possible for each other to exist in the spirit of cooperation. On the other hand, then I began to think about something like Vijay Dandeta, who I had read an interview with him a long time ago, and I thought like, really I should go and interview him because I think I'll get to understand something through this. So in a way the film gets made up of also, I guess, me thinking about it, thinking about it and thinking, how can I understand the themes of this better and what are the other spaces that will inform this thinking? With Munni Badnamui, actually what happened is that I heard from a friend that it's an old song. And then I began, and Rani and Rampat were in the film. I couldn't find them. I mean, I was like desperate to find them because I heard their version of the, somebody uploaded a recording of their version of the song. The way that I found them is also very interesting because I asked a filmmaker friend of mine who had made a film on courtesans. Uh, she's made a fantastic film called The Other Song, which is about the wife culture, which is a courtesan culture that is, was outlawed under colonial law and that only a very few people remain. And I said to her, that, do you think somebody from that network might know Rani and Rampant? And so actually an entire kind of detective work by the courtesans 
started to take place. They started asking the musicians they knew and others they knew. But have you heard of these two people, Rani and Rampart? And I would get these phone calls like, we have ascertained that they live somewhere in Kanpur. You know, they have their own, they, they go from place to place to perform and they have their own van. So that is how we finally found Rani and Rampart. So actually that's interesting because like the metal bands and their networks, Rani and Rampart too belong to an older world of not Anki and performances from like early 20th century, late 19th century, which those networks still kind of somewhere vestigially exist and that's how I located them, right? You can't just do a Google search for Rani and Rampar and find their number. Uh, though maybe they're on Facebook now, I don't know. But so I think like there was a lot of this kind of thing, but when you're making a film, I do think, especially when you're making a film which is more conceptual, you know, sort of narrative of a certain context, you have to think like that. You have to keep thinking like, how does this occur around us? What are the examples of this that I might find? And sometimes you just have to go blind into a space and say, I think somewhere here, something must be happening around this. And you do sometimes stumble upon things, right? Yeah. So even Irfan, who collects all those cassettes, he was the one who had uh, he, he, he was the one who had given my friend the Rani and Rampat recording. So then I went back to him and then I discovered he has this whole other uh, you know, so actually it's a world you enter. Mm -hmm. And when you enter the world, you start finding that there are many, many denizens of this other space. And that is a very exciting kind of journey. And as you talk to them, of course, you're thinking about the issue changes. Even the commentary about love that the film has, it actually grew because, yes, I was making those connections in my mind as we were editing. But if you notice, first there are always partners, right? Everybody's doing things in partnership with each other, hence the partners in crime. But everybody brings up these ideas of love and sex when they're talking about it. I love this very much. I know it really matters to me a lot. Or, well, I don't want my daughters to be in this profession because it's different for us to fall in love because we are artists and we know what's what. So it also was in the metaphors that people were using that actually this idea surfaced for me better. So yeah, it is like submitting yourself to that conceptual landscape and allowing yourself to be changed by it. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you very much.